Hansen leaned back in his chair and sighed as the holovid began its third repetition. The face of the High Commander faded into view. Commodore Hansen, this recording is for your eyes only. Failure to follow protocol will result in immediate action equal to wartime desertion or combat in subordination. The rank you have been assigned is effectively a field promotion. It will last for as long as necessary, after which you will return to a promoted rank of First Lieutenant. The function you are to perform is a translator between the Admiral and the Fleet Captains, and the rank of Commodore will ensure that the Captains will have to follow your orders. The responsibility is not one that I place lightly, especially not on an officer as inexperienced as yourself. Unfortunately, you are the best qualified to take on this role. In the event that the Admiral loses the support of the Captains, each will display a token on their communications. These tokens will indicate whether you were to have their support if the need should arise to overrule the Admiral. Erikesh's face faded as the Holofit reset itself for another repetition. Hansen rose from his chair and stored the data chip in his personal safe. From the bunk behind him, a sharp sucking sound was followed by a helium-affected voice. So, Darius squeaked as he lay on his back with a large tank of compressed helium clutched to his chest. The High Commander is granting you mutiny rights. It seems that way, sir. Hansen looked out to the viewport of his cabin. What I don't get is why. Darius sucked another blast of helium and slowly began humming Dixie. Then he got up from the bunk and placed the pressure tank on the floor in front of the door and mounted it. Hansen walked over to the entry and opened it. Darius removed one of his maglock boots and slammed it across the valve. The pressure containment mechanism gave up its function and the tank mounted admiral shot down the corridor slammed against the sides in turn, and disappeared in a mixture of released helium, clattering wall panels, and a very focused rendition of Flight of the Valkyries in full falsetto briefly interrupted by sounds that could only be described as a teenage chipmunk regretting its choices in life, timed with the ricochets. Hansen picked up the now broken valve remains and left his quarters. The permanent market army on the wall had suffered losses to the cleaning drone, but had received reinforcements in the form of sheets of tinfoil attached to the wall using pop rivets. At the drone's docking station, the front line of drawn soldiers had suffered grievous losses, and a small contingency of officers had positioned themselves on the opposite side of the hatch. The drone itself was making a tremendous effort trying to navigate past the flaring tinfoil sheets in order to perform its program function. Cleanliness. Hansen arrived on the bridge. The fleet was still in transit, so no communications were possible using traditional means. He pulled up the details on the Admiral's formation design. The Papa Echo November formation consisted of a front of three gyrating rings of heavy armour, clad corvettes, each ring rotating in a direction and speed different from the others. The crown was followed by a shaft of rings consisting of destroyers and support corvettes. Again, each ring was rotating at an offset speed and opposite direction of the ring immediately in front of it. At the back of the formation, another two spheres were made up of intergyrating rings. They were made up of carriers and large support vessels. The two spheres intersected along the centre axis of the shaft. Hansen couldn't help but be impressed. Each ship was, at all times, covered by the point defence zones of at least three other ships. The placement of the carriers in the aft of the formation allowed a secure corridor for the sublight fighters to accelerate through before exiting through the constantly moving tip essentially making them almost impossible for sublight targeting systems to lock onto before they had reached peak velocity. The real genius of the formation was the varying rotation speeds and direction of the rings. All of the ships in the fleet would have free firing opportunities, but at varying intervals, apart from the tip, no single ship would be directly targetable for more than a second. The Papa Echo November 1-5 formation allowed sustained firing, fighter support and interlocked point defence for the entire fleet, extending the estimated engagement window by a multiplier of four. His particular study of the formation and the tactical possibilities once they arrived was interrupted as Darish crawled onto the bridge with the now empty helium tank strapped to his back. Ah, Hansen. He heaved for breath as the dead weight of the 50 kilogram container strained on his back. I once told myself I shall paint a dick across the night sky and it shall be glorious. Derish collapsed on his side and tried patting the gas canister on his back. Alright, you've had your turn and I've had mine. 
He then made an effort to get into a seated position, but the weight of the canister made the effort futile. Admiral, the straps! Hansen offered the Admiral who was stuck on his back, arms and legs flailing wildly in an effort to do something. Anything. Derish looked down at his chest and saw the two leather belts he had used to secure the canister on his back. He then released the buckles and crawled, heaving and sweating to his chair. Then he took a full view of the 3D formation that was displayed on the console. Glorious, I said, he mumbled softly to the phallic-shaped force of destruction. When did you make that promise, Admiral? Hansen knew this was a personal question, and that personal questions were off-limits between a commander and a subordinate. Hmm. Derish raised his eyes for the hollow projection, and looked Hansen directly in the eyes. The slightly off-focused look that the Admiral usually sported vanished for a brief moment. Just before I shot Captain Erland's grandfather in the head. Twice. A brief flicker of pain washed over Derish's face, as the memory seemed to be forced from his mind. Then he self-fived, and walked off the bridge. Hansen left the bridge and made a beeline directly to the engineering workshop. He needed answers. Commodore! Chief Engineer Nick Cray looked up from his workbench as Hansen entered the workshop. Chief! Hansen nodded for the man to continue. I need a pigeon. Cray stopped fiddling with the service drone he was working on. A pigeon? You do realise that using pigeons during hyperjumps is prohibited? You know what, I'm not going to ask. The chief walked over to an unmarked container in a corner of the workshop and pulled out a container the size of an ostrich egg. Here, use it carefully and make sure the weapons op is not on the console when you load it. The pigeon canister launcher was a tube, located in the hyperdrive, that allowed a single canister to be fired at a magnetic catcher on any other Terran Alliance ship. Even though the canisters themselves were launched at hyperspeeds, firing them during a hyperjump was considered dangerous. Each canister could hold one data chip, and the communication form was one way. The system was named after the ancient long-distance communications method it resembled, carrier pigeons. Thank you. Hansen took the container, and left. 